So welcome everyone. My name is Kimberly Elman. I'm manager of national mentorship programming at Best Friends Animal Society. And today we are going to meet with four industry leaders who are working hard to create a culture of engagement among staff, their city or county leadership and their communities. Each of these panelists will share how effectively engaging others can help elevate your life-saving work. Each offers us a unique perspective based on their animal welfare professional experience. But before I go ahead and introduce our four panelists and get started, I do have a few housekeeping items for you. First, everyone will be automatically muted for this webinar, so you don't need to worry about accidentally unmuting yourself. If you do have a question for us, please type it in the Q&A box. Note that questions that are submitted through the Q&A box are only visible on our end. We may pause a few times throughout the presentation to answer questions if they are relevant to the topic at hand. And time permitting, we'll take additional questions at the end of this presentation. I'd also like to note that this webinar is being recorded and keep an eye on the chat box because just before the webinar ends, I'll post a link to some wonderful resources. And the webinar recording will be posted on the Best Friends website within the next week. So with that, let's go ahead and introduce our four panelists. So first, I'd like to introduce Holly Sizemore, our Chief Mission Officer with Best Friends Animal Society. Welcome, Holly. Thank next, you. you're welcome. Next, we have Arlen Bradshaw. He is a Senior Advisor of Community Relations with Best Friends Animal Society and, important to note, a current county council member with Salt Lake County. Next, we have Paula Powell. She is a senior strategist with the South Central Region at Best Friends, and she is also the former director of the City of El Paso Animal Services. Thank you, Paula. And last, but absolutely and definitely not least, we have Mike Shumate, the Director of Pasco County Animal Services in Land Lakes, Florida. And for those of you that aren't sure where Land Lakes oh, is, it's in the Tampa Bay area. So he's right in the Tampa area. So welcome and thank you so much for spending an hour with us to share your experiences and your knowledge. Let's get started. We have a lot of ground to cover tonight. I want to talk about defining culture, engaging staff, how you engage your communities, and then municipal leadership support and relations. So let's go ahead and start with defining culture. And Holly, I'm going to start with you because as a member of our senior leadership team, you help drive our culture every day, every month, and every year. So please share with the, pan uh, with the panel and the audience why it is important to define your organization's culture. Thank you. I think one of the biggest uh, mistakes that people make is sometimes they get their D's mixed up. They mistake defining for dictating. <laughs> And so we all know that culture is something that we all as a team create, we all live, we all know for those of us who are hiring that it's often a reason why someone wants to come work for our organization is the culture that they either perceive or are, want to be a part of. So I feel like defining your culture is really important and it can be easy to be a little too broad, I think, when you define it, because you read all that, it's everything. So how can you make it a little more um, understandable for everyone? And the, I think the first way to do that is to ask, do you all agree on what your organizational culture is right now? And not just leadership, workshop that with the, the staff. The, the thing that I love to think about, well, what is the foundation of culture that is actually something really understandable? And it's all about values. To me, values are the kind of fuel that, that fuels culture. And at Best Friends, we have our values very, we have them stated in a very succinct fashion. And then we have sort of even a guide that goes a little more into detail about what those values mean. And the way we then help to live and continually define that culture, because people aren't going to really remember it, is to, I think one of the best ways is to highlight when you see it happening in your staff and to acknowledge it when you're happening and when you're seeing it in your staff. And to me, that's the best way of defining it is when you're just pointing it out in, when it's actually happening. Excellent. What can happen if you don't clearly define your culture? Well, there's going to be a culture no matter what. Exactly. And so people, people will make up their own definitions. 
And, and everyone's perceptions, Best Friends Workshopped our culture in it, in initiative. And when we listed out those values, we did find there were a lot of different perspectives about what that meant. And we even went through and said, which one of these really resonate with you? You wrote your own down, but which other ones really resonate with you? Mm -hmm. And people circled those. Right. And so we were able to get kind of a consensus of what does the majority of our staff members feel about what these values mean to them? Because, and then we made sure that we communicate, communicate, communicate that out over and over and over again. Um, and not in a way again, that is like, this is our culture <laughs> because Nobody wants to be dictated what it is. They want to just be acknowledged for living it. Thank you, Holly. That's an excellent transition to my next question, which I'm going to pose to Arlen. And many of you may or may not know, Arlen served in a variety of capacities with us at Best Friends. He's also been the executive director of Best Friends Utah, as well as the regional director for the Mountain West state. So Arlen, Holly was talking about communicating. How should you communicate your culture, both internally and externally to stakeholders? Yeah, I, you know, I think that's a really interesting question because uh, communication is important. But I think, like Holly said, to to parse between communicating and dictating, I think the most important thing is to really live your culture. And and as Holly said, your culture is oftentimes how you uh, are enumerating your values. So if you're really living your values as an organization that should be apparent to those externally. Um, and if you're communicating those values and what you stand for as an organization, and even your goals, what you're trying to accomplish, communicate that externally, live your values, and it should be pretty apparent to your external par uh, partners what the culture within the organization is. But then internally, we all know that that's a whole different <laughs> uh, ball game. And, and sometimes, you know, things can look a little more rosy from the outside. But I think internally, uh, it's really a matter of setting the expectations for your staff and continually revisiting. Uh, Holly mentioned this as well, but I think it's really important when we're talking about culture that you're also malleable in terms of making that culture grow with the organization, grow and learn from new employees and, and, and support the older employees as or veteran, not, not necessarily older, but employees have been there. Um, and, and through that process of setting the expectations for your own staff. And, and again, I think really making your goals clear to everyone and, and showing that, you know, I think culture to me is really being supportive of your colleagues and showing that you care for your colleagues. And, and it, as long as that expectation is set from the leadership on down and you're truly living those values and living that culture, you know, that's the best way I think to communicate that and, and live that internally as well. Thank you, Arlen. Mike, I wanna to talk to you next because Pasco County Animal Services has one of the most engaging cultures I have ever seen in a municipal agency. So congratulations to you and your you. entire team. What are you doing to get staff on board with the culture that you've created, that wonderful, healthy, engaging culture at Pasco County? Well, I think it's important, you know, and, and I love what everybody said so far about culture because it is the lifeblood of an organization. It, it creates your reputation literally in the community. It can break down barriers and all that. But for the team, you really got to know, you know, coming in where where they've been and what they've been accustomed to, what what burdens they're carrying from from uh, previous leadership or from you know everything they've experienced. And and for our team, it was going through a, a rough transition of trying to become from a high kill shelter to a no kill shelter, and we were just starting that when I got here. So this team had been really beat up by a lot of uh, uh, animal advocates and stuff. So. Um, for me, it was a matter of, of, of learning who they were, what they were really about, was their heart really in it, uh, do they know what their why was, things like that, and, and, and then start building on that, start encouraging, because that's what they really needed at the time was uh, they needed some really good wins. And so we started looking at uh, what's the low-hanging fruit that we could uh, achieve for them. And, um, and as we, we really started to model and, you know, it's, it's like Arden said, you got to really, you got to have that leadership factor in there where you're modeling, you're showing them every day what, what that culture is going to be. And then communicating it, of course, uh, we laid it out for them exactly what we wanted. 
uh, to see them become what uh, the shelter vision was. And from there, you know, it was just a matter of, of, you know, engaging them. And when I say that, I mean, you get with every single person, you talk to them, you learn who they are, what they're about, um, you know, you ask them for advice. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you've got to, you've got to really see and learn what they've been through and then, uh, and what they're experiencing and what their fears are for the future. So, and then you can work with all that and really put it together to, uh, to see what you need to do as a leader to, to get them where you want them. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Mike. So let's talk a little bit more about staff engagement. You just mentioned that, right? Engaging each and every one of the staff. Paula, you were the director at uh, the city of El Paso for four years. And I might add, Paula was with the city of El Paso for a total of 28 years. So she's certainly the right person for this panel tonight. But share with us some examples of how you engaged all of your staff. Because what I see sometimes in working with agencies is they're doing a lot of life-saving, right? Um, But the staff are feeling disconnected to the work. They're burned out. They've got compassion fatigue. They're not engaging well with one another. They're oftentimes leaving that organization. And so I'd really like to hear what you did to engage all of your staff, um, not just leadership and middle management, but even the frontline staff members. Yes, I uh, actually agree with everybody again, like everybody before me said, uh, living that culture is, is what's so important and living it from the top all the way down to to the last volunteer that that's helping you is so important and engaging them. And so I'll give you an example of some of the engagement. When we were developing our, our culture and our plan, we actually listened. And that's that's a topic um, that I could talk a lot about. Actively listened to each and every employee, learning that history that, that um, Mike talked about and learning what's worked in the past, what hasn't worked, what they've read, what they've researched, what they've studied. Um, I tell you, when I started with animal services and, and learning how all of the employees were so into the mission, but just really needed a little help with working together, I, it, it, was, it came really easy actually. And when we involved them and listened to everything they were doing to include every pencil they sharpened and every uh, crate they put together for a, uh, uh, a transport or whatever it was that they were doing and showed how important that was to our mission, mm. it, uh, it, it skyrocketed and the culture just continued to improve. Listening to them, involving them in change is so important as well. Um, as, as we changed to managed intake during COVID, we involved all of the team in making the decisions and giving, um, giving us a lot of, of those decisions and letting us know what would work and what wouldn't work and giving their ideas and then using them really helped uh, improve morale and, and the culture. I mean, we use some of their ideas and we're very proud of, of the work that they did. You listen to them. <laughs> Listening right? is so important and using their examples and calling them out on, you know, hey, this was their idea instead of saying, hey, this was my idea or our idea. Go mm-hmm. ahead and call them out and let them get the rewards from, you know, their idea that they came up with to help save more lives. Absolutely. So let's talk about engaging new employees. Mike, do you do anything in particular for new staff members that are joining Pasco County? Oh, we do. We do a lot. Uh, That's it it literally starts in the interview process. I'll be honest with you. You know, we we engage them right there because we want to find about out about the person. Uh, We want to find out, you know, do they know what they want to do? (laughs) You know, really, you know, we can explain the job description and all that to them, but they don't really understand what it's like being in a shelter sometimes if they've never been in that environment you know they visit it but they don't see the behind the scenes stuff and uh, when you pull back the curtain and you reveal what's going on to everybody you know it, it could be it could be rough for people especially when they engage but um yeah that interview process uh, we like to make it light with them we like to keep them um you know very informed about what we do 
Um, and so it starts right there about, you know, we, we talk about uh, vision, mission, values, and things like that right there in the interview because they may not get the job, but they'll remember the interview at the end of the day and they'll know who we are and what we're about. So that's important for us uh, to get that out there. But, um, you know, af after we do hire someone, we have a we have an onboarding that we do here and it's, it's literally a week long. They they get to ride with officers. They get to clean kennels and, and that may not be their job, but they're going to do everything everybody in this shelter does practically. Uh, so that they can see how it all just meshes together because we all do. We all come together. Every, everybody touches a piece of something that someone else is going to hand off to them. And that's the way we created the team atmospheres that we have is that we have to promote each other at every single position. So uh, they get to see that from, from, you know, the very first day they get here. And uh, of course, the county has a brief little onboarding. And then later, our branch has an onboarding. So they get to know what the branch does, which, you know, we have a lot of great partners in our branch, human services, you know, veteran services, senior services, parks. I mean, we libraries, we got all the great stuff in our branch. But um, but once they get here, you know, um, they go through that process. I'm the last guy they see. So for me at that point, you know, it's it's all about getting to know them and um, and 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 really finding out where they want to be in the future. Uh, so that we can help them get there. And we lay out a, pl a plan for them and a path and tell them what they can and can't do and how they could achieve it and not achieve it and things like that, you know. Uh, so it's it's important for that. But, um, uh, you know, just, you, you know, I, it's it's so important that, you know, when when you when you get people and, and um, they come to the shelter is to just really make them feel uh, welcome. And we do that in a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, as soon as people uh, get on their, their first day of the job and they do something good, we, we want to celebrate that with them. You know, it's just like a little thing, but, you know, we try to do that. And, and I try to go and visit them when they're on their first day of job just to, just to make sure they're doing well. And, and the reason I do that is because, you know, I have an open door policy. Uh, a lot of people walk by my door, they'll, they'll stick their head in and say, hey, but sometimes I've found out people are scared to knock on that door. And so I want to make sure people understand I'm not a scary guy. You know, I'm, I'm, I know I'm the boss, so to speak. But, uh, yeah, come talk to me anytime. Share those ideas. You know, just like Paula was saying, you know, we got to listen to them because that's how I get some of my ideas for, for things is to is to um, have them stop by and do that. So. Thank you, Mike. I'm really glad to hear that you have a full onboarding process for new employees because I think in animal welfare, we're used to just kind of throwing people in yeah. and like it's sink or swim mentality, but really um, to help engage them, right? And define that culture, you need to have a formal onboarding process for everyone new, whether it's a new staff member or they're in a new role, you know, within your yeah. organization, you need to have that. So I'm thrilled to hear that. Thank you so much. I want to talk about about some low cost or free ideas for engagement. And I want each of you to, to come up with one or two, you know, engaging staff, and this goes for volunteers too, does not have to be expensive. It's not about throwing, it's nice to throw your staff a party at the end of the year and give out plaques and awards. They <laughs> like that, right? But what it's really about is the daily ongoing engagement and the small things you're doing to make them feel part of something bigger than themselves. So I want you guys to share with me and we'll go around. I'm gonna start with Holly. Holly does something I love that's called what's working, what's not. So Holly, would you share with the audience what the what's working, what's not is and how many people under mission advancement you do this with annually? Uh, yeah, so t it's, a, it's a way that I get to connect with every single team member uh, on, on, uh, in my area and my team's area and it's uh, just over 200 people now. So I spend, it's sort of like the speed dating of engagement. And I, people get an email in advance and Holly, you know, this can be informal. You can prepare if you want, it can, but what I want to, to hear one-on-one -on -one from you in your own words is what's working well for you, what's not working or what you might like to do a little bit differently and what's next what do you see as the big secret sauce? What are you most excited about for where we're going and what do you think is gonna really propel us forward? 
And it's really fascinating. And I'm like, there's no wrong answers. It can be very specific to you and your role, or it can be more broad to our entire organization and our, even our whole entire movement. Like there's just no wrong answers. So if people are more thinking about them and their own role or the bigger picture, they have the freedom to relate to the questions however they see fit. And it's just fascinating to me. And I, I, it, it's certainly no replacement for routine management, right? But in my role, I don't often, and because I, I do uh, work with a lot of remote staff, I, I can't go out to the floor and, and spend time with people. And, and also I think sometimes when we do go, when I was in an environment where I could go out to the floor, that dynamic that I got by going out to the floor was very valuable but it was different when I sat down one-on-one -on -one in a quiet spot and give each person an opportunity to be heard. And interestingly, in the beginning, I was a little nervous about it because I thought they're gonna feel like, oh, 15 minutes. Like I was worried that people would feel that that was a token um, effort on my part. But by and large, the feedback anyway was Oh my gosh, thank you so much. And I got so much out of it. I got so many yeah. wonderful nuggets of, of truth and vulnerability and opportunities to improve and just confidence in my own for my own right in that I like we have a rock star team and it gave me ideas on how we can even build on our strengths. Yes, excellent. 200 employees is a lot of people to do that with. I think every everyone understands that 15 minutes is times 200 is a huge chunk of time, but I think it's a phenomenal thing that you do every week, every year. So thank you for sharing. Arlen, what did you do to engage staff when you oversaw the Best Friends Utah program as the executive director? Yeah, well, I think Holly just referred to it as going to the floor, maybe, but, but you know, I, I think in, in this dynamic, relationships are the most important. And I think demonstrating to your staff that you care about their day-to-day -day and what, you know, what they bring to the organization is so important. So uh, I found it really valuable to carve time out. Um, and, and it's hard when you're dealing with administrative and managerial stuff, but carve time out at least monthly to, to kind of embed yourself with your frontline staff. So go go spend you know a couple hours in the morning with animal care cleaning cat kennels alongside them and see what conversations you know come up in those those instances you know go uh, spend uh, some time helping process adoptions with your you know uh, your front of house staff. Mm -hmm. um, really valuable for me was uh, spending late nights cat trapping <laughs> because <laughs> TNR was really a new concept to me when I really, you know, engaged in that work. And, <laughs> and the, the relationships that I have that are still the strongest uh, with my former employees that I used to directly oversee and, and still throughout the organization at Best Friend are those that I had those relationships with and those experiences with. Um, and so I just think, you know, that doesn't cost anything. It's really a time management for you as a leader to be able to carve that out. But I, you know, I think that just goes so far for those staff members to, first of all, have their leaders helping them with something directly and, um, you know, sharing in that burden, taking part in, in their day to day. Absolutely. You rolled up your sleeves and you did things that you asked them to do every day. So excellent. Paula, how about you? Did you have anything you want to add that you did with the city of El Paso team? So glad you called on me next because I was afraid that I was going to not have something. But yes, the, we have the peer-to-peer -peer, um, mentoring program. And what we found that a lot of people that were like cleaning kennels all day really didn't get to do some of the fun stuff. And like, like, you know, and seeing some of the results uh, that were happening in, in the community and getting to meet the community. And so we started a peer to peer program where some of the uh, staff that worked the kennels would be able to work with an adoption counselor for a while or go out in the field for a while and got to do some of the fun stuff uh, that, that we get to do in animal services. We found out that a lot of them when they did the peer-to-peer, -peer, we're engaged, really had a lot of great ideas coming off of that. They have, they, and also they, they really liked and appreciated their, their staff members that were working in other sections. 
and all of the work that they did. So you don't hear that, oh, we do more work in cleaning kennels than the adoption counselors do. You don't hear that type of thing anymore because when we would hear it, we'd go, okay, we'll set you up with peer to peer and let's see how that goes. And, the, and then we would get an after action report after that. And we came up with a lot of improvements in both areas because people like with a fresh eye would get in exactly. and, and, and see things. And it really blossomed. And I got chills right now because I'm thinking about an incident <laughs> where the peer to peer really blossomed in that they developed relationships with people that weren't really in their little circle, but that they could go to when things were hard, when they had to go through like a a diet and care or a a bad incident with animal control. And so they were also working as counselors for each other and helping each other. And it was, it just started adding up and adding up when we first started it. And now it's because anybody at that shelter could work in any other department if we needed it. So it was, you know, we got the training in, but we also got the improvements that we needed and, and the employees, you know, the most valuable asset got taken care of with uh, some counseling and stuff. So it was that peer to peer was pretty cool. I love that two heads being better than one and cross training all at the same time. Excellent idea. Thank you. Well, we know that you need to engage the community because as much as the team wants to save them all, you need those folks in your own backyard to get it done. Right. So I wanted to take some time and talk about community engagement. Mike, I'm going to start with you and we're going to talk about volunteers. You and your team spent the last couple of years really taking a look at your volunteer program. You had a solid program to begin with, but you really did a deeper dive to identify where you had some staffing needs and maybe gaps and where you could find some skills-based volunteers to help close those gaps above and beyond the traditional dog walking and cat handling. In fact, one of your new skills-based roles, having volunteers ride with animal control officers in the field was so novel and and so fresh that we had your assistant director speak about it at the conference last week. So um, share with the audience a, a couple of the new roles that you guys created as a result of doing that deeper dive that helped with staffing gaps. Oh yeah. I mean that, um, well, first of all, I got to give a big shout out for, uh, to best friends, you know, for actually giving us the opportunity to go through that, uh, service enterprise training. Um, that was just a real turnaround for us. Um, and, uh, Kimberly, you and your team that came out to, uh, to really help us with that and spent time with us. I mean, we spent a lot of time and you guys guided us through that. It was, it was a great experience for us, but I think probably the biggest thing we got out of that, and it was really the tipping point for our volunteer program, is when we just made the decision to trust our volunteers. You know, I mean, I, before that, our our staff and our volunteers, you know, they were, there was a little friction there. I would entertain those things all the time. You know, I got a volunteer at my door talking about a staff member. I got a staff member talking about a volunteer, you know, and and. And finally, uh, when we decided to open that up to really trust those folks um, and to break down those barriers uh, that that was associated with the untrust or mistrust or distrust or, but anyway, it, it, we did away with that and um, and we said, okay, we just choose to trust. <laughs> and and when we started to do that, we started looking at all the more so many more options we had with our volunteers, for example, data entry. You know, the staff was so guarded about data entry. No, no, you can't let the volunteers see this. You know, that takes a public records request, you know, and we said, no, it doesn't. You know, it's it's they could see it. They need to see it. You know, it helps them. So we just we did away with all that. We actually started uh, creating job descriptions. Uh, Like you said, it, it wasn't just the average volunteer position. It comes in, no rhyme, no reason, walks dogs, leaves. We really nailed our our volunteer program down to what is best going to serve the needs uh, of the organization um, and also help the volunteers actually achieve some stuff and do some things they could be proud of. So we started the skills base. We started looking at what we could do. So we data, we, we had data entry people for medical teams, uh, for in, intake teams. 
uh, for just about every team that we had, where there was data entry, licensing, everything, they're doing it all now. Uh, we opened up our medical department. You know, that was low. We had the doors locked before, you know, and volunteers really couldn't get in. But now we open the doors. Uh, they actually have a key card uh, that we, we let them share to get in and out because they have physicians that they come and go. Uh, they're doing all our instruments, you know, autoclaving all the instruments for surgery. They're, they're helping the animals through recovery. We have job descriptions for all that stuff. Um, our, our dog walkers are really feeling the pressure because, uh, you know, they're, they're, they feel a little left behind. But I think the, the big breakthrough was our animal control, as you, as, uh, you mentioned. Um, we actually wanted to, to get them involved in that. And the big hang up we had, actually, we really wanted to get them involved in TNBR uh, because it was taking a lot of the officer's time to go pick up cats or help, uh, you know, community with cats and stuff. So we got a donation of a van and I said, well, let's see, let's talk to county about it. So we went to county, um, you know, uh, risk management. And basically we said, hey, you got volunteer firefighters driving trucks, come on. You know, so they they just said, okay. And we were so surprised when they did that, you know, that it broke down another big barrier everybody seemed to have. And uh, so as long as they took the driving course and did all the rules that the employees did, they were already covered by our workers comp. So it, it just seemed natural to get them in there. We got volunteers, we sent them out doing TNVR pickups. And then we said, well, hey, how about really helping out with those, you know, confined strays and those other little things that animal control officers don't like to waste their time doing, so to speak. They got big, bigger fish to fry, so to speak. And, uh, and so we said, sure, let's do that. So we created a position called animal uh, control specialist. And, um, or animal control assistant. And, and when we did that, we, we hired her first one. She got on the job, she was doing great. And Hillsborough hired her as an ACO, an animal control officer. So that program just went, you know, you right train, down. You trained quick. her well, Mike, you trained her well. Yeah. I mean, she, <laughs> nailed, she nailed it down there and she's doing good. So, uh, so you know, th those things just really opened the door. And what was really interesting about all that is the staff began to train the volunteers in those positions. So now you've got a lot more interaction with those, those things. And when you build relationships, you know, sometimes the arguments just fall to the wayside, you know, the complaints, the, yeah, all this. So absolutely. It really bonded um, our, our folks together. And, and I think that really helped us. But again, it went back to, I think the biggest thing was the trust issue. You know, if you're going to, if you're going to have people there working with you every day, you got to trust them and you got to include them in what you do. And in, inclusion was a big thing for us. So. Thank you, Mike. So you touched on an excellent point and actually rolls right into my next question very nicely. How do you get that staff buy-in for volunteers and fosters? Oftentimes, staff think that volunteers will be replacing them, right? Or yeah. they've had a bad experience with volunteers, you know, in the past. And so they're hesitant to work with them or try something new in the future. So, so Holly, what have you found to be the secret recipe for getting staff buy-in around volunteers? Great question. I think fundamentally, it does go back to what Mike was saying, it, the ability to trust and be trusted. Yeah. It's the reverse. And I do think, look, we all have examples of where a volunteer has come in and been a disruption. And we've all had staffers who have done the same. And we've all had, quite frankly, most of us have probably had relationships that have done the same. So this is just sort of the human condition. So I think for us, it is being able to communicate again and being able to highlight to the staff members the accomplishments of the volunteers and how they're helping to contribute to our greater goal and reinforcing that our values of kindness and, and curiosity is going to help volunteers to succeed. Even if they do get hired by you or someone else, we love to hire our volunteers. And I know that sometimes we get this resistance from a cultural point of view because we're like, oh, but if we hire the volunteer, then we're not gonna have that volunteer anymore. And if we can kind of think again, that's part of our pipeline into employment. Those are our best future employees. So uh, curiosity, trust, and being able to really show the team members how volunteers are contributing. Thank you. So 
Paula, I want to ask you about staff buy-in for the community, right? Above and beyond volunteers, sometimes it's hard to get municipal staff or even shelter staff in general, right, to buy into trusting their community. They oftentimes see the community as the problem, but they may not see that community or the community members as a solution, right? So how did you go about getting staff buy-in for El Paso and the community as a whole? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked me that one because I think it's integral for us to insert ourselves into our community. And I talk a lot about that when I talk about strategic planning and developing culture. And mm. what I mean there is that have the staff and, and yourselves show up at community events. Um, and it doesn't even have to really be animal related community events but just show up to, together there and see the community at its finest, see the community when they're pulling together. I, I mean, I can give you one example. When we had the August 3rd shooting in El Paso, it devastated our entire community and to include members of, of uh, animal the animal services department. And we had a memorial service, service and we went out in, in uniform to work it and to stand with our community, to stand side by side with our community during this time of need. Now, it was second nature for us to do that, first of all, but second of all, looking back, a lot of those people came into the shelter, expressed their gratitude for us to being out there, realized that we were out there helping them. And we just started integrating ourselves into the community, getting to know members of the community, you know, especially during, during the last year, getting to know members of our community that we've never reached before. And then we showed, we showed them what we could do for them, delivering food during COVID, uh, letting staff do that and, and seeing the results, seeing how good that made you feel to help someone really help them believe in their community. So I'd say the number one thing is integrate yourself in the community. And sometimes that doesn't involve animals, but eventually it, it always will involve the caregivers of animals. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's number one. And when the staff saw that, they really did start believing in the community again and start, you know, believing in, in we could make these changes together with this community because we saw how great they were during that August 3rd um, shooting. We saw how everybody came together to help. And no matter if you knew someone who got, who was in the shooting or, or nearby, um, we, we all came together. And that I, I think was a turning point for El Paso. Thank and, you. Yeah. That's wonderful and lovely. Thank you for sharing. I know that was a hard time, but thank you for sharing. I'm glad it brought the community and the shelter together. So Arlen, you have the unique perspective of being in animal welfare and in leadership capacities, but also being a current county council member. And we're gonna talk more about that here in a few minutes, but I do wanna ask you, since you can look at it from both sides of the table, what do you feel are examples of effective community engagement? How should a municipal agency go about communicating their life-saving work to their community? What are ways that you feel are beneficial looking at it from both sides? Yeah, you know, in, in my experience with uh, the Salt Lake County Shelter, I, I, was, I was picked out <laughs> when I first ran for office as an animal guy and was kind of uh, really brought in uh, to help change the culture and many of the things we've been talking about at our shelter. But one thing that, that we have had in our county, and, and I know this maybe isn't practical for every jurisdiction, but you know we have a dedicated PIO, public information officer, that works just within the shelter. So they're, they're not for the broader division, they're not for the mayor's office. It's someone whose sole mm -hmm. role is being able to highlight the work of the shelter on a daily basis. And, and I know that that's a luxury, <laughs> um, but, but, it's, but I, I see it as working because you have someone who's running the different social media platforms daily, who's looking mm -hmm. for 
positive stories to put out to the media, um, who actually is really good in my next segment, but creates the, the, the newsletters and whatnot that go to the community, but also go to the elected officials. Um, and I think, and even if you don't have that as a, as a dedicated position, the strategy is something that the leadership team of the shelter needs to talk through and have a written communications plan. Um, because if it's haphazard, it's never going to be as effective as if you're able to look forward and, and, and make it part of the culture of the shelter that sharing out those positive stories and, and even not so positive when you, when you need help, asking the community for help um, and just making that part of, of the regular work of, of the shelter staff uh, is going to pay dividends over time because then the, the community fills a part of the work that the shelter is doing. Thank you. Mike, is there anything you guys do at PASCO to really engage the community? I love Arlen's suggestion about having a, a PIO, but anything you guys are doing yeah. routinely that you think has helped engage? And I'm going to pick up the pace here a little bit, but go ahead, okay. please answer. Yeah, no, I, I just think it, it's being very honest with the public in every every transaction, you know, and, and really showing the empathy um, that they need to feel that you're not a, a government institution. You know, we, we put up a lot of barriers and walls sometimes as government, and we do a lot of self-serving things uh, as a government uh, because we have rules, right? And so we see uh, more and more, every time we try to engage people in the community and stuff like that, we wanna find a way, not to say no, but find a way to yes. And that's what we tell our staff all the time. We gotta find a way to help these folks. Uh, what, what do they need? Listen to them don't don't be judgmental let's let's find the problem let's fix it and so that's what we try to do as much as possible and it's really made a difference in how our community perceives us uh we've seen a lot of negative stuff uh turn positive really quick uh, over the last couple of years and so that's that's really a beneficial to us Thank you. So let's talk about dealing with negativity from community members that don't support the work you're doing or don't feel you're doing enough. I'm going to start with Holly because I, I think sometimes people think that at Best Friends we don't deal with that negativity, but we do. <laughs> so Holly, how do you go about, as one of our senior leaders, how do we go about handling that um, as a private organ, a 501c3 organization? And then Paul, I'm going to come to you for a municipal perspective next. Well, and since a lot of my career has also been based on public-private partnerships, I, I end up in the crossfire a lot, and I, it's a place I actually like being because um, it helps create more resiliency. And to me, that is one of the most of the animal welfare organizations who do really well. Resiliency is a big part of their culture and how they're able to infuse and define and help members embody resiliency to me is one of the biggest culture elements of success that I see in our industry and probably many others. But, um, you know, yes, best friends has haters too. And sometimes the vitriol, like, so sometimes people think because, oh, best friends is sort of the sanctuary, no kill organization that we don't have haters. Well, we do. And for me, I, I have to help my staff and even myself allow yourself the emotion of feeling hurt, first of all, and then don't project that, don't displace blame, Get have a safe place to acknowledge the grief and, and the hurt there, but don't don't wallow in it. And what yeah. can we do then together? How can we show resilience today? Because that's gonna bring us all up. So for me, it's really, um, I think becoming a lifelong student of resiliency is probably the most important thing in our industry. I think that's very true and very well said. Thank you. <laughs> Paula, About uh, I want to focus on the municipal side of things here too. So how did you deal as the director with non-supportive community members and some of those nasty comments on social media or um, to the news? We'll talk about constituents in a second. <laughs> I, I use data. I use data to, to prove yeah. a lot of things. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it says a lot. You know, they're feeling certain things, but the data tells the story, the true story. So I'm able to use data a lot to deter that negativity. 
Mm-hmm. The other thing I do a lot of times with that is, is again, I, I bring up this word again, is listen. Sometimes that negativity has some truth to it and you might want to listen. So listen to it. Um, a lot of times I'll, I'll even bring in the group and now I'm calling it the Holly Sizemore way because I, I thought it was my own way, but now I know I stole it from her. But I, I probably asked, stole it from you, Paula. I, oh, <laughs> I ask, I ask the group I, a lot of times. I go, "What do you like?" First of all, I try to start on a positive note. What do you like about the way we're doing things? And the second is, what needs improvement? And the third thing I ask them always in in my meetings, and it's it's been very successful, is if you were a boss, how would you do it? And write down all of that stuff. And I come up with maybe some things that I can use and they start to see it and they start to change. Some people might not ever change. That's where you're gonna use the data. But some people, they just need a little bit more listening to and a little bit more attention. That's an excellent answer. So taking those same non-supportive community members when they become constituents for a council member. (laughs) And it's one thing to complain on social media, right? To get on your Facebook page and complain on social media. It's another thing to get on the news and it's even something else to go to your council member and complain about you, right? And try to launch an investigation. So Arlen, what advice can you give to to shelter leadership and and even frontline staff on how to deal with those constituents who who run to their council members and, and, and are trying to kind of stir the pot, so to speak. Yeah, well, you know, I, I feel like Paula said this, but, you know, being in public service, you know, being a public servant is, is, is hearing out the public, you know, you, you've got to, you've got to let people vent, you've got to hear what they have to say, and you have to be responsive. But being responsive doesn't mean you have to, to do exactly what they want. But, you know, what w- we all know there's lots of opinions in our world on on how shelters can should operate you know what animal control ordinances should be and and behind those opinions are a lot of emotion and and i feel like there's there's kind of two spectrums you have people who are going to come at you thinking you're not doing enough for the animals but there's also a subset that that i've encountered that think you're doing too much for the animals that you know you're going beyond what you know animal control should be And, you know, you you kind of have to deal with those two perspectives. And I think for those that want you to do more for the animals, you know, figure out, can you, you know, are there policy changes that need to be made? Are they internal shelter policies? Do you need to go to the governing body of your jurisdiction to make a change? Or is it simply a matter of communication? Do they not understand why something is the way it is or everything that you are doing to support the animals? And, and on the flip side, you know, I, I think of naysayers, particularly I, I mentioned TNR earlier, because that whenever that's like new in a community, some people have a really hard time with that. They just don't understand. They're like, well, why aren't you just okay. taking the cats away? <laughs> um, and, so, and you can't ignore that because if, if there's that negative factor out there, you've got to figure out a way to mitigate it and, and try to address those concerns. And, and you're not going to make everyone happy all the time. That's also part of just realizing you know that that you can't please everyone and and as a public servant you definitely can't please everyone because uh, there's too many different opinions out there but i think hearing people out recognizing that that's important and and identifying where positive change can occur and how to mitigate complaints in in the most positive way possible are really the best the best approach you can take Thank you. And Arlen has created a wonderful document on shelter leadership and policymakers, and I'm going to include that as a resource in the link. So definitely take a look at that. Thank you, Arlen, for taking the time to put that very well-crafted document together. So building upon developing strong relationships with municipal leadership, Mike, you've got a great relationship with your county commissioners. What advice can you give shelter leadership regarding how to work with city or council or ca- county council members? Well, I think the biggest thing for us is is just getting to know those members of the board. You know, our board of county commissioners, um, you know, as soon as they get elected, you know, one of the first things I do is invite them out to the shelter, you know, and and, uh, and you try to be uh, in places uh, to support them as well. 
um, you, you know, it's like Arlen was saying, you know, everybody has a need out there. Everybody wants help and they've got an opinion and stuff like that. But when they call the commissioner, it's probably because they got to know somewhere else along the line. Sometimes they just call because they know the commissioner or something, and then it just escalates from there. But however you get the call from the commissioner's office, they're really looking for your help. And, and you got to deliver that. You, you really got to help them out. You either have to explain to them what you can do to go take care of this for them uh, and for that constituent, or, or you got to tell them why you may have to uh, do something else instead. And, and, and why it may take time, because they don't always understand those things. So you're kind of educating them, but you're doing it in such a way that you're very respectful and, and everything. Because, you know, let's face it, uh, those are the folks that are gonna, at the end of the day, approve your budget. Uh, they're gonna be looking at everything you do, but um, we, like to, uh, we like to share as much as possible with them. So, you know, and it's building that relationship with them. And when we have a lot of positives um, to go to them, they really, you know, I, I think one of the best things I heard was one of my county commissioners, basically um, we had gone to them and asked them to sponsor a resolution uh, because we, we won the animal control officer of the year for Florida's uh, animal control association. By the way, we did that three years in a row now. So congratulations, go, go team, right? <laughs> um, but uh, you know, that really, that was something very positive they wanted to do. And then uh, at the end of that comment, the commissioner made was says, Mike, we used to get calls all the time, complaints about animal services. Now I get calls all the time and they're saying, what a great job you guys are doing, you know, and thank you because they went out and did this for us or whatever. So I think that's, that's the biggest thing. Uh, respect what they do. They're, they're in a very tough place. Uh, those, those folks. And you, you you know, just because they call you, they're not on your on your case or anything. They just want some help. And that's when you have to deliver for them. But you're not delivering just for them. You're doing it for the people out there that really need the help. Absolutely. So. And you do go the length. I recall working with you and you reached out to me over email last year because you wanted your team to get an award and you wanted my feedback <laughs> on working with them. So you definitely try yeah. to elevate your team with the county council <laughs> members. So thank you. Paula, how yeah, about you? 28 years with the city of El Paso. Surely you have some <laughs> pearls of wisdom to share. <laughs> I do actually. I Number one, try not to have anything surprise them and yeah. so how do you how do you do that you get in front of them as often as you can and i you know i prided myself that i was in front of council every city council meeting for two years running straight and it was hard because you don't have a council item every every two weeks right and so you had to find innovative ways to get in front of them. The, um, whether it's the dog food purchase order or um, <laughs> you, you know, you have one of your um, volunteers that you wanna talk about how great they were or wh whatever it is, you always get in front of them so they know you're there. Make sure they have the data when they need the data, give them the reports that are due, make sure that they have that the information they need if they do get the phone calls yeah. and make sure they know about all the changes that are happening make sure they're aware of any change that's going to happen you know you're getting ready to reopen make sure they already know your plan um and you know the last thing give them credit give them credit for this success because be honest yeah. with you you wouldn't be in existence if it wasn't for the work that they did so make sure that they get the credit they deserve. Invite them out to your openings or your special events. Show up to their events. Mm -hmm. Like I said, integrate your, yourselves. Continue to do that. It's so developing relationships. A new person comes in, there's a change. Make sure, make sure you're part of that changeover. Make sure that they know um, your operation, your, your mission, your vision, your values, your budget and, and sure. how all of that works. Make sure they have time in front of you and can meet your staff and see how great the work they are. Uh, continuing to do that and, and you'll be successful. Thank you. And I think Arlen liked your answer when you said, give them credit, because I saw a little bit bigger <laughs> smile. He was already oh, smiling, but I saw a little bit bigger smile come through. So we have just a few minutes. I do have one more question. Arlen, was there anything else you wanted to add about 
advice for shelter leadership when working with municipal leaders? You know, Mike and Paula, I think, showed why they're so good at their jobs. I mean, the, the, the real key is ensuring you have that relationship in advance before you need something. Because when you go in front of the council, you're either there for, for budget or you need a policy change. But going into a council meeting, if you've already established those relationships and it, it, it just feels more comfortable for you, you're going to be more effective yeah. in the moment. And, and as long as you know your argument, you know, as Paula said, you've got your data um, and, and you've been honest uh, and they trust you because you are the subject matter expert for your jurisdiction. And, and if you have already established that relationship, you're going to be more effective in your role. Thank you. And again, once again, this panel fits into my last question perfectly, which is, <laughs> Are there things you should or should not do during a municipal meeting? You talked about being prepared and having the data. Holly, is there anything else you think that folks should do or shouldn't do when uh, presenting at a municipal meeting? Arlen taught me this. Um, don't assume that they're going to remember. We eat, breathe, and live this every day. And you tell them something once, and they have so much on their plate. I feel like there's a lot of power in repetition and to the point of um, have them meet your staff, meet their staff. Like, because they're gonna help with that repetition. They become your champions of your causes. That relationship is just as important. And then it was interesting because I read recently in, the, in, in a magazine that it defined political astuteness. It said the ability to manage and lead through competing workplace interests in order to achieve a goal. Um, and it's primarily learned through mistakes and failures. And I think for our, the best platform for sort of enticing the idea of, oh, there may be some mistakes here, but we're gonna learn from them is the power of the pilot program. And, and if you set up with your government leaders that it's a pilot, it already kind of sets this, we're, we're gonna test and try, there's some experiment in here, we may have a few false starts, we'll be informing you along the way. And that helps create this foundation of uh, we're holding ourselves accountable, but there, but we may have a few bumps in the road. Pilots, that's always a good thing to start with. <laughs> So anyways, I just wanna let the audience know that I have put the link to all of the resources. They're on a Google Drive, on Google Drive, but everyone should be able to access Google. I find that, that, that every shelter can access Google. So take a look at those resources. Arlen's wonderful document on policymakers and shelter leadership is in there. Our cultural initiatives playbook that Best Friends put together is then in there. Some volunteer engagement resources and some great articles on why you should engage your community as well as your staff and what happens when you don't. I've also put my email in the chat. It's team2025 at bestfriends.org. So if you have any additional questions after this webinar and you're like, ooh, I wish I would have asked that, email me and I'll make sure these four wonderful human beings get that question and we get you an answer. So with that, we are at the top of the hour. I definitely want to take a moment to say thank you to all four of you. Wonderful advice, great human beings doing great things. Thank you so much. It was an honor and a pleasure to spend this hour with you. And I also want to thank our attendees because Best Friends could not get to No Kill 2025 without you. So thank you for everything that you are doing day in and day out to save lives and help us save them all. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you.